what's going on everyone thanks for tuning back to the channel today i've got travis drum with me travis how we doing buddy what's up zach we're here we're back travis is here to impart all the world's knowledge and wisdom to you today to help you grow in the grace of god so that you may be a man or woman after his own heart travis has all the answers and that's why we do this uh together yeah you, sh you should close the video because whatever else zach's about to say is probably a lie too so <laughs> I've never told a lie in my entire life, Travis. Um, yeah, not in the last three seconds. What'd you get for Father's Day? Um, I got some cards, some some handmade gifts from my kiddos, and got to spend a lot of time with them. So it was a really a, good weekend. I got a cool cup and had all the superheroes on it and talking about how dad was a superhero and all this other stuff. So when I get my backdrop set up, I'm gonna put that cup like right here on the shelf. There you go. So. I, I didn't know they made a cup that had uh, Don Preston and Mike Sullivan and all them guys on it. So, <laughs> too much. Sorry, too, much. too early. It's too early, guys. All right, we got the Pied Piper again here. Uh, we're looking at chapter two. How can a book awaken love? Is the idea of it? And these are short chapters. So just so everybody knows, if you don't have this book, Travis, would you agree these are short chapters? Oh, very short. I mean, okay. you're talking, what, 10 minutes? Yeah. Yeah. If Eight, that. Six and a half, if you're my wife, uh, she, she can just look at them and inhale them. So <laughs> it's insane. Okay. Two main points that stood out to Travis were these. What the Bible means when it speaks of the natural man or in the flesh. And number two, the usage of the Old Testament scriptures pertaining to eschatology. You want to go to the next slide there? John yeah. continues. Go ahead, Zach. With by reiterating the aim of this book, and it's to help you love the second coming. And ask the questions, how can the natural acts of writing and reading a book result in the supernatural experience of love for Christ and his coming. Let me read that again. How can the natural acts of writing and reading a book result in the supernatural experience of love for Christ and his coming? Did you think that chapter answered this question? Um, somewhat. <laughs> well, I mean, he's building off the previous premise, right? That if you're going to love the second coming, this has to be a work of God. It has to be a supernatural work because those that love the second coming are those that love the Lord Jesus. Um, so picking up on that, you know, what? how can this natural means of reading or writing a book result in some of that love? And I think that's just where he's going is just to build on that. You agree with that? Um, well, I don't think you can agree with the question. Do I agree that it takes a work of God to love God? Yes, I do. All right. That's and I fair. think we're going to get into some of that too, maybe. What do you think it means like as as far as the second coming goes, when you're thinking about second coming all the time, like do you ever get accused of people saying, well, you talk about the second coming or eschatology all the time? No, I've never heard that one time today. Um, uh, it, yes, we, we hear that all the time. That's all you guys teach. That's all you guys talk about. It's all eschatology. If, And I think that's the whole problem that people don't understand in their mind, eschatology is a subset of Christian doctrine. In our mind, it's the whole thread that runs through this whole thing. Yep. There's nothing that's not touched by whatever you believe about eschatology. Nothing. We, because we're not, it's like, they have these certain texts, the Olivet Discourse, Revelation 21, and, and certain texts intertwined here and out that Paul's just randomly throwing in in his epistles, and he'll connect them to the Old Testament some. And, and they've got this whole subset of things that are disconnected to everything else that's going on in the story. And you and I are saying, no, eschatology is, it's the whole redemptive process that's taking place. Yep. And it, it's a thread that runs right through the middle of it all. Uh, yep, so that's right. Um I, I, somebody commented on one of my videos yesterday and dropped a couple suggestions for this guy that refutes our view. You know, he refutes the preterist position. And I pulled one of them up. And in the first three minutes, this guy was saying that everything the Apostle Paul wrote had nothing to do with Israel. And it was all about the Gentiles. And if you pull his writings out, you have this whole different eschatology. And I, I just turned it off. I was like, man, if you believe that, I've got some oceanfront property to sell you in the desert. So. It's hard to have a conversation with people that think that way. It like, really is. 
But sure. this this is a subject that touches everything, and that's something that a lot of people with, like that guy, is there's one eschatology. Like, there's not different streams of thought. You know, the resurrection, the abomination of desolation, yada, yada, yada. All these things are running down the same one-way street. And there's no side roads. There's no pig trails. They're all on the same page. Okay. Let's keep going here in our slideshow. Okay. He first builds his case with the thought that this is necessarily a work of the Holy Spirit. And he quotes 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, talking about the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. He is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Um, Piper's Reformed. He's a Calvinist. You're going to look at things like not able. Um, mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you think he's saying here in 1 Corinthians 2, 14? not able. I mean, does this legitimately mean that people who are not born of the spirit are not able to accept the things of God? Yeah, I, th I think that's what he's getting at. And, you know, you know, you and I might take a maybe slightly different view on some of these terms, like the natural man and the flesh and so forth. But <clears throat> is the general crux of what he's saying here true? Um, where I'm at, I say, yeah, um, I think so. So you see a contrast in Scripture in a couple of different places, and we're going to go to some of them. But you've got the Sukikos, which is this natural man, versus the pneumatikos. And pneuma, obviously, is spirit. So there is a contrast between a natural man and a spiritual man. And for the spiritual man to be called a spiritual man, he must have the spirit. Um, and so I, I don't have a problem with what Piper's saying here. So, uh, again, I think if you're going to love the Lord, that in and of itself is a work of the Spirit of God. Um, flesh this out just a little bit more right here. Um, when when you're saying that we might take a slightly different slant, what Travis is saying is that we have a tendency to see things a little more covenantally than what other people do. Um, and we'll kind of get into that in a minute when we talk about the flesh. So when when we say that, we, when we're reading 1 Corinthians 2.14, knowing everything that Paul's quoting from and everything that Paul's using in the Old Testament and just kind of the context that's there, we see, uh, when we're reading the New Testament, guys, we see a covenantal backdrop to it. Is that fair to say? Yep, I think that's accurate. Okay. So, that I mean, that's our, that's always in the back of our mind. You want to read that one? He then says the natural person is simply the normal person who does not have the spirit of God inhabiting and transforming his heart by faith and says Jude 19 is speaking about the natural man, those who are devoid of the spirit. And I think if you read Jude 19 in a lot of translations, it uses the word sensual man. Um, but in the Greek, it is the sukikos. It's the same thing as first Corinthians two, um, natural man. So, uh, again, now he says it is simply the normal person who does not have the Spirit of God. You know, we might split a hair there and disagree with that a little bit. But again... Okay, why? Why, again, do we, would we disagree with that a little bit? Because when I read the book of Jude, I see Judaizers everywhere. Exactly. Well, and that goes back to that covenantal thing. You know, these were... Um, I mean, would you think it's fair to say they were old covenant apostates? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and, and that's who me and you, you and I, sorry, let me speak proper for our non-Arkansans, um, we would take that in those in that covenantal sense. So, And, you know, I'll admit 1 Corinthians 2 is one I would want to look at more, um, but I think Romans 8 is pretty clear on this, and I think in Jude it's pretty clear on this, that there's a Jewish context to those that are in the flesh or to that natural man. So, I think that that study of in the flesh is super, super interesting. And I mm -hmm. think it's harder than you think. I, there there are two verses in Romans 7. I'll When I look at one of them, I say, that's clearly a reference to the law in the Old Testament. And you drop down 13 verses later, and I'm saying, seems like he's talking about the flesh being his physical body. I don't know. Yep. So... Yeah. Okay, he continues. Another way of describing the natural person... Is to speak to him, uh, to speak of him as having the mind of the flesh or being in the flesh. I think Travis, a study needs to be done, and maybe it's done, and I'm just so ignorant I don't know that it's out there. But when we talk about the flesh and works of the flesh versus works of the spirit, okay, or fruit of the spirit, I think people 
somebody needs to do a good study on um, how certain sin they were connecting to the flesh to the old covenant. Because when I see a lot of these works of the flesh things, I'm thinking somehow or another these are connected to the old covenant system. So what what Travis is saying when we're talking about maybe we see a little more, take a different slant on. Okay, yeah, we see that if a person's in the flesh that he's living in sin. We get that. But it seems like Paul's connecting the idea of that living in sin back to the old covenant system, which I know is the law, mm -hmm. uh, which is connected to it. But it seems like there's more there to me. Yeah, so I guess just to clarify, we're not saying that necessarily what John has said here is wrong. We're just saying that we don't think it's it, – we're not. it's not less than that. We're just saying there might be a little more to it. You know, there, there may be another rock or two that needs to be turned over to kind of peg down more specifically um, how these terms are being played out here. Well said. Also, folks, take note that Travis is on a first-name basis now with Piper. So uh, it's important to, important to get that. So whenever you're refuting somebody like this, you know, you, you, ha you have a right to call him by the first name. I'll uh, call him Mr. John from now on. Sorry. Uh, flesh, in Paul's ordinary use of the word, refers to fallen human nature considered as independent from God and uninfluenced by the indwelling of the Spirit. Again, I would say not less than that, but flesh probably means more than that. In this condition, people are at odds with God. Again, we agree with that. Mm -hmm. And in that condition of alienation and resistance, they do not and cannot submit to God's instruction. I agree with every bit of that. No? Yeah, no, I do too. I was just thinking, but go ahead. What are you going to say? Well, um, I don't know. I've lost my train of thought. It's too early and I need another cup of coffee. And now you got me thinking about how I'm on a first name basis with John. So In, in that condition of alienation and resistance, they do not All right. can't, cannot so, submit to God's instruction. So according to John, that's just the natural human default condition. We're born natural or in the flesh. But my question is, you know, if, if we're right and that study is out there and somebody can prove that these terms are related to the old covenant, then that is a false statement. Um, because if in the flesh refers to being in the old covenant or under the old covenant, um, can we look around at anybody today that is under said covenant? And the obvious answer is no, because it hasn't existed for the last 2000 years. And so, and I get, it. you know, it's really nitpicking and I don't, mean to be um, a hair splitter necessarily but you know the point is if if you can't be under the flesh anymore then this isn't the natural human default condition um, and that's not really a proper understanding all right so what's the other option then just dead far off like the gentiles were yep i think so you just don't know the lord whether whatever term you want to use whether you call that dead or far off you know we are brought um from darkness and into light through faith. And, you know, I think a lot of times in these discussions, it's a matter of semantics, you know, because we have an idea of what we mean when we say dead or when we say far off and everybody has different views on what those things mean. The point is, you know, is somebody reconciled to God through faith in Christ Jesus or are they not? And at the end of the day, you can call it what you want to, but I think that's what it all boils down to. Let me read Romans 7, 4, and 5, just so people, because some people are listening to this saying, y'all are nuts for thinking flesh is an old covenant reference. <laughs> Let's and, hear uh, it, Zach. Romans 7, 4. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ. Okay, there's some corporate covenantal terms. Mm -hmm. That you may be married, marriage, supper of the Lamb, to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God, work of the Spirit. For when we were in the flesh... And notice how he's gone straight from law to flesh. When we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. So Paul and the boys were past tense in the flesh. So is this talking about being in physical bodies? But no, I mean, it can't. It can't. Where do we have Romans 8? Nine? Okay, it's next. Romans 8, 7. Listen to this. Because the carnal mind is an enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Okay, were the Christians in the first century physically in the physical flesh? Right. Are we today? Yeah, that's the same question. I mean, 
So when you're thinking about these ideas and you get to passages like 1 Corinthians chapter 15, when it says flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, well, you and I think the kingdom of God came in 8070. Do you agree with that in full? I do. Flesh and blood can inherit the kingdom. Well, we're all in flesh and blood. They were in flesh and blood when they inherited the kingdom. Hebrews chapter 12 says they were already receiving the kingdom and they were in physical flesh and blood. So that's why, guys, we're me and Travis are reading flesh natural versus spiritual, suki cost versus nomadic cost, and we're we're seeing covenantal terms in that because there's no way every time Paul's using this, he's talking about us physically being in a body. And I grant it. I grant there are times like Romans 7. Let me just read it. Romans 7 down here in verse. Well, now I can't find it. Verse 18, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells for it's present within me, present with me, but how to perform what's good, I do not find. I read that and say, okay, I can see how somebody thinks that's talking about a physical body. Now, right. could I explain that covenantly? Maybe, but I, I don't know. That's just why I, I think going through Hebrews has been so important to me on this. Because we got to flesh and blood in Hebrews, and it's connected to death, just like Paul's doing it in Romans 7 and 8. And it's connecting it to the old covenant system that's passing away. I don't know. I just think this is a I think this is something that people need to study. Because it's hilarious to me when people will come and still say, Well, the full preterists think that the kingdom is, you know, in heaven, it's not on the earth or whatever, and flesh and blood's not gonna inherit the kingdom. So therefore, we don't have to have a physical body to inherit the kingdom. I'm like you completely whiff the whole point of what we're talking about. We don't even think that's what flesh and blood's talking about. Well, and you, you know, you to that point, you brought up the book of Hebrews. Well, how many, like, what percentage of Christianity believes that? And, and I'm not trying to argue for or against. Just think about this: what percentage believes Jesus is in a physical body today in heaven? Probably 99.999. Right, the, the majority. But the book of Hebrews talks about when he was in the days of his flesh, past tense. Well, if flesh is a reference there to a physical human body, why why is the author of Hebrews speaking of Christ as, as though he no longer is? You know, and, and you and I would say, ah, maybe we need to look at that a little more because, you know, Paul talks about him being born of woman under the law um, in the flesh, right? And so maybe that's what the author of Hebrews is getting at. When I went through that and did my deal on Anglos, I, I went to that text and said, y'all better watch it because I think this is covenantal and not... Yep. The other way. Well, I think, and I don't know, Don can correct me on this. So I don't want to speak wrong if not, but I'm just, just looking at this from afar because me and Don never had this conversation. I know a lot of people come after Don because Don will say, well, Christ isn't in the flesh. You know, there was a time when he held pretty strong to Christ not being in the flesh. And Bondar does that in his book. Um, but I think this understanding is kind of causing Don to retrace a little bit and saying, eh, maybe I'm understanding that wrong. Maybe it's a covenantal term and not talking about him physically being in the flesh. So you're exactly right. If, if y'all want to put flesh all the time to be talking about physical bodies, you better be careful because you're fixing to play Jesus right out of a, a body. And, and that's a big deal to y'all, evidently. So, yeah. Well, Zach, let's keep rolling. We need to get to the second point. Sorry. Um, hey, when I read this, you know what I thought? What would you think? I thought this was basically our reason for reviewing this book. I thought this was good. John, <clears throat> excuse me, Mr. Piper says... The experience of God's heart illumination is called by Paul loving the appearing of the Lord. It is a spiritual affection rooted in real, glorious, objective facts revealed in Scripture. It is mediated through true knowledge of those facts. This is how a book may become the means of your loving the second coming. Thus, the natural act of providing knowledge, like writing this book or making this video series, goes hand in hand with the supernatural experience of seeing the greatness and, and glory and worth of Christ in His coming. I love what he says there, and obviously we we disagree, Zach, with a lot of his assumptions. But the fact that uh, he says that this is to be rooted in real, glorious, objective facts from the scriptures and mediated through the knowledge of those facts, I just really appreciated that. And I thought, man, that's true because you know, at the end of the day, we can disagree on interpretation, but we all agree on where the source is. Um, or at least we should. And, and John's not appealing to a creed or a confession here or some church historian or any of that uh, for this affection for the second coming, but he's taking it straight back to the book. And that just resonated with me. And anyway, that's all I got there. 
I'm with you. I'm for it. The, the Southern Baptists are with you, too. They didn't want any of them creeds accepted. They sure didn't. Okay. They, they didn't want Apollo or, or his son. None of them creeds, did they? <laughs> he discusses Peter's foundation for his beliefs about the second coming. The first is Peter. Uh, own eyewitness experience of Jesus, which according to John, uh, we will discuss later in the book. Yeah, looking forward to that. Want to see what he does with that. By the way, this we're moving on to point number two here. On the second point, he says, second, he moves from the foundation of his own eyewitness experience of Jesus to the foundation of the inspired scriptures, which for him meant the Old Testament, although he refers in 316 to the letters of Paul as part of the scriptures. So Peter's own eyewitness account plus uh, his use of the Old Testament scriptures. Is that what you're gathering out of that statement? Yeah, so so John is essentially saying that Peter's entire eschatology is built, number one, on his experience with Jesus, but number two, on the scriptures, specifically the Old Testament scriptures, although, again, he does say that, you know, Paul was writing scripture. But the point is, uh, and we talked about this, you know, a little while ago, is Peter inventing something new? Is he going down some trail that hasn't existed yet with his eschatology? And the obvious answer is no, and John sees that. And I know that you and I would say, amen, we agree. Well, it's funny that all these New Testament writers, and I'm sure they talk to each other, maybe more than we think, or maybe less than we think, I don't know. But they all come to the same conclusions. It's because they're all drawn off the same things, and that's the Old yep. Testament text. Yep. And so. Zach, just, just think back to, I don't know, three years ago. Did you... Did you think that way about the Bible? No. Why did I never think that way about the Bible in my entire life? Me neither. And I, I don't think I ever would have just verbalized this, but I thought the left side of the book was more or less irrelevant. Travis, I'm going to tell you what I thought. And this, and I, I promise you this is what I thought my whole life growing up in church. I thought, and I am dead serious, I thought the writers of the New Testament are idiots. I mean, that's the way I thought about it. But they're, dude, they knew so much more. It's, it's, I was the idiot. There is so much more going on in the New Testament than I ever realized in my life. And the reason is, yep. is because of the idea of futurism. We thought they were just restating again what had already been said in the Old Testament, I guess. like we're, or, or they were saying something completely different, irrelevant, disconnected from the Old Testament. That might have been a lot of what I thought. But if what was predicted in the Old Testament was coming to pass, and they're quoting from it in the New Testament— there is so much more going on than we ever thought there was. Mm -hmm. And the I New think. Testament. Go ahead. Go ahead well, I was just going to say the New Testament is literally saturated with the Old Testament. And you can't understand the right side of the book properly without spending time on the left side of the book. And that is something that I spent years just completely missing. And, you know, you wish you could have them back. But at the end of the day, you just learn from your mistakes and keep rolling. Right. Yeah, and you're glad you know it now. And. Mm -hmm. People can say timing indicators and all they want, whatever. Friends, it ain't timing. The, the timing indicators are important. I agree. And like I can't unsee them the way that they are. But what makes this thing work, you could scratch the timing indicators if, <laughs> if the New Testament writers weren't using the Old Testament text the way that they are. Yeah. That's the that's the glue that holds this thing together. You can't you can't extend it because of the way that they use this stuff. Mm -hmm. They don't, if the new Testament writers do not use a word, use a phrase, use an old Testament passage, the way that I have used it my whole life and thought about it and interpreted it. I don't have the right to contradict their usage of that term. I do not know more than they do. Yeah, I agree. You don't. So when Piper's bringing this out and saying, Peter's drawing off his old Testament accounts, that's massive. Yeah. Well, and I got a feeling, and granted, we're only on chapter two, but I got a feeling that might get him in hot water later. We'll just have to see. You think you're going to be able to hold him to the fire on some inconsistencies on their yeah. use of the Old Testament? I mean, if he's going to bring up Peter again, probably so. Because right. I know that he has a radically different view than you and I do. You know, we'll just think about the heavens and the earth. You know, if he goes to Second Peter 3 at all. Um, he's going there. He's yeah, I think he will too. Well, what's he going to do with that? And is it going to come from Isaiah 65 and uh, you know, all the other passages? I highly doubt it. So, but I don't want to cast a judgment before we get there, so we'll see what he does. Well, instead of prevenient grace, Travis has presumptuous grace. Okay, yeah, second Peter, 
just remember, viewers, that John said it. That John. Peter's eschatology came from the from the scriptures from the Old Testament. And we have the prophetic word, the scriptures, more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And to that we say, Amen. And then he I, says about Second Peter. Uh, 1, 19 through 21. This is one of the clearest teachings in the Bible concerning the divine inspirations of the Old Testament scriptures. Therefore, Peter was eager to lay a double foundation under his teaching about the second coming, namely the eyewitness accounts of Jesus and the God-inspired scriptures. So John here is saying that Peter is clearly believing that the Old Testament, the Tanakh, that it came from God himself, that this wasn't some human fabrication um, that these are divinely inspired writings. And to that, Zach and I, we agree. Zach, what do you think? I used to hear people say all the time, if you can't, if you can't explain the gospel without going to the New Testament, then you don't know the Bible. That is such a true statement. And I can do that better now than I ever could in yeah. my life. Because it's there. That's, that's the premise they're drawn off of. Yes, it is. Yeah, and that's something I probably missed too. You know what I mean? Just just being ignorant of the left side of the book. Um, but like you said, you begin to learn these things and you just see it more clearly. All right, this is the quote you love, so I'll let you read it. Uh, Mr. John says, The affections that magnify Christ are affections awakened by a true sight of Christ, a true knowledge of Christ. So it is with the second coming. The only love for Christ appearing that honors Christ is a love that is awakened by a true knowledge of his appearing. And I love the quote for a couple different reasons. Number one, I agree. You know, you have to, if you're going to truly love the Lord, you have to have a true knowledge or a true sight of him. You have to have the right Jesus, in other words. And to that, I, I agree. I say amen. But also specifically about the second coming, because that let's go back to what we said a few minutes ago. People accuse us. That's all you guys talk about is the second coming. Now, is that true that that's all we talk about? No, it isn't. However, do we talk about it a lot? Yes, we do. And why is that? Well, I think it's because, number one, we understand the theological implications of the second coming. Like we said, you know, it there's nothing that it doesn't touch um, in theology. But number two, because it's rooted in truth, right? And we love it because we see it in the scriptures. And you start with timing indicators and then you work your way connecting Old Testament and seeing how they're using all this stuff. And then you begin to understand the nature. And what happens is this thing comes alive and you love it, not because it's something you invented, but because it's the truth. And because God's word makes more sense to you now than it ever has, even though we have a long way to go. Um, and it's rooted in, in just the fact that God said it and we believe it and we love it. When I wind up at the conclusions that if whatever I'm teaching, it doesn't matter if I start in, wherever I start at in the Old Testament and I carry it to the New Testament, it always winds up under the heading of what I think people would consider eschatology. And it's because I used to think under the realm of systematic theology, and I don't think that way anymore. I think of biblical theology, maybe even from an aspect of protology, beginning and carrying it all the way through, which is something I was accused of, we're, we were accused of not doing. And we're literally the ones that do that every time we teach. Um, so that idea of how it always winds up there is because we're starting in the Old Testament, carrying that thought all the way through to how the writers of the New Testament do it. And we're trying to show the full consummation of it. And that full consummation of the redemption plan is how we would culminate eschatology. Because we don't think it's talking about the end of the planet. We talking. We think it's talking about connecting it to the redemptive covenantal plan. Right. So that that was the eschaton. I mean, for all intents and purposes, it has nothing to do with the earth burning up. The eschaton or the end was about restoration with man to God and the completion of that restoration. So, do you think that you've been illumined more, and that you know more, and maybe even Piper can't recognize? You know that you love God more than he does because you recognize his appearing and that it's already happened or no, I don't think that, but I do think that um, he wrote some pretty heavy words here because according to John, the only love that truly honors Christ about the second coming is one that's rooted in the true knowledge of that second coming. And so if we're going to honor God, then we need to be willing. And this is, there are probably people here in this that are rooted in these reform camps. And I think you especially see that there. 
but you know it, it doesn't need to be rooted in your in your creedalism or in your confessions or in your tradition and here's the thing a lot of people are not willing to shelve those things even though they see the train coming to honor the truth right to honor christ and if i'm understanding john right and i think he would agree with this even though he disagrees with our position if that's if the word of god takes you to full preterism or premillennialism or any other system then the only way to truly honor god in that is to submit to his word right and we're saying amen, and this is where it's taking you, if you're going to be honest. If these guys love the Lord more because they're looking for his coming, think about how much more they would love God knowing that he's already appeared. Right. So. Well, uh, I would butcher the quote, but there was a MacArthur quote from years ago that essentially said, you know, you can only love God so high as you can go deep in understanding or something to that effect. And um, I agree with that. I mean, you, you probably love your wife more today than you did seven, eight years ago, and it's because you know her better, right? I do. Andrea, when you watch this in 20 years, I love you so much. <laughs> but but more 20 years from now than today, right? That's right. I'm going to love you more when you watch this than I am when I said it. That's right. All right, everybody. Thank you. I, I talked to Miss Kenna like Alan Jackson. You know, he, he said, if I had to – if I had to do it all over, I'd love you all over again. That's where, that's where I'm at, Miss Kenna. All right. That's good. Adrian Rogers said, if I had 10,000 lives to live, I'd give everyone unto Jesus. I thought that was a good quote. Amen. So. Well, we've got Alan Jackson, Adrian Rogers. I think it's time to wind it down, Zach. All right. I'm for it. Signing off. It's the boys in the bunker. We'll see you soon. Chapter three next week.